Well, good morning and welcome. I'm glad that uh, you are all here this morning to continue in our study on the attributes of God. Uh, this morning you get two for the price of one. Uh, we're going to talk about God's grace and God's mercy. And uh, so by way of introduction, um, I just wanted to begin uh, with a personal story. Um, as many of you know, I grew up in the Midwest, uh, Iowa to be exact, and um, I came from a Christian home. We um, went to church every day the doors were opened. I was sprinkled as a baby, and I was confirmed into the church at age 12. I went to Sunday school. I went to all of the youth activities. Um, I even went to parochial school all the way up and including the eighth grade. And there I memorized many Bible verses as well as my memory works. I memorized a lot of uh, uh, verses and hymns as well. And as I reached my teen years, I think I was, a, was an okay kid. Um, I didn't drink or smoke um, or use bad language. I stayed out of trouble um, for the most part. And I would expect that most people who knew me would have thought that I was a nice young Christian guy. But there was a problem, actually a pretty big problem, and that is that I did not understand the gospel. And you say, well, with all that background, how could you get to a place where you didn't understand the gospel? I guess I'm, I'm not really sure. Uh, I, uh, I don't know to this day if I wasn't taught or if I was just such a knucklehead that I didn't get it. Somebody jumped to conclusions, I know. Uh, but either way, either way, um, I didn't get it. Now, I did know that Jesus died for my sins. I did know that much. I just didn't know what that meant. I was kind of, you guys all know the story of Philip uh, and the Ethiopian uh, eunuch, uh, where um, the eunuch is reading scripture, and Philip asks him, do you understand what you are reading? And... Um, he said to him, uh, how can I unless someone guides me? That's all I wanted. I wanted someone to guide me um, in the truth of salvation. And so I began to ask questions. And as I give you some of these questions, you'll see just how clueless I was. Um, I didn't get it. I wanted to know things like, why did Jesus have to die for my sins? I knew he died. I just, why did he have to die? What did his death actually do? Why didn't God just snap his fingers and save everybody if we needed saving so badly? I mean, God is God, so couldn't he have saved us any way that he wanted? And why did God have to come to the earth as a man? What was wrong with Moses? Or maybe King David, there was a man next to God's own heart. Why did it have to be Jesus? And what was this sin thing anyway? I wasn't all that bad, I thought. I mean, there's, there's bank robbers and there's murderers, and I wasn't that. So what did God need to save me from? And the questions went on and on, and I, got, I really got no answers. I think I frustrated some people enough that what they finally told me was that I just needed to have faith. Now, that's not a... Wrong answer. I just didn't know what I was supposed to have faith in. And I walked away from church thinking that God must have just one day decided to save mankind. So he randomly chose Jesus dying on the cross. Could have been anything, I reasoned, but that's what he picked. And so now it was like a, a rule or something. You just had to believe that Jesus died on the cross. You had to believe that. And it was all up to me. And it was a dozen or so years later, I guess, um, before I set, church, set foot in a church again. And I spent those years, um, embarrassingly, getting into more trouble than I even knew existed. I guess making up for those earlier years. 
But at the end of that time, because of a series of events that left my heart and my spirit completely crushed, God stirred my soul, and I went from blaming him for all the problems in my life to a renewed search of the truth. And in the mid-1980s, I found a guy on the radio by the name of John MacArthur, and his explanation of salvation in the book of Romans was like nothing I had ever heard. It actually it brings tears to my eyes now. It, it brought tears to my eyes because I finally understood salvation, and it made so much sense. And I'll talk about that more later. Um, but a few years after that, um, through my study, I began to realize that part of my gospel woes as a young man was my lack of understanding of God. I didn't understand who God is. I didn't understand the attributes of God as we are uh, studying today. And I hope we're studying these not just on a Sunday in an hour, but that you're digging into these attributes so that you know more and more about God. Well, if I had known God, uh, many of my questions would have been answered. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. A number of uh, weeks ago, probably longer than that, months ago maybe, Michael taught on the holiness of God. And we all know that God is holy, right? God is holy. I probably even would have said that myself. But like everything that goes through my mind spiritually, what does that mean? I mean, think about it. God is holy. God is absolutely perfect in every respect. God is perfectly righteous. He's without sin completely. And he is morally pure. But as such, God in his holiness hates sin. And he cannot condone evil or have any relationship to it. God is the moral and ethical standard. He is to be feared for he must punish sin. And a holy and a righteous God demands holiness and righteousness from us. Matthew 5.48 says, Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. 1 Peter 1.16, Be holy as I am holy. But man has a problem. I had a problem. Because we know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You all know that verse, Romans 3.23. Not only are we not holy, but we are utterly sinful and as such, cannot enter the presence of God. And what we deserve is eternal punishment in hell. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. And it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this comes judgment. Hebrews 9.27. And what is that judgment? Well, Revelation 20 tells us, tells us it's the lake of fire. And on your own, you can do nothing about it. That's important to know. Titus 3, 5, he saved us not on the basis of deeds we have done. Romans 9, 16, so then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God. The fix for the problem of sin can only come from God as our best efforts are no better than filthy rags as Isaiah 64, 6. No one can reach God's righteous standard and therefore our relationship with him is non-existent. And God who is holy must punish sin. That is his justice and that is our due. And I needed to know that. And I would have if I'd have known more about the holiness of God. But man has a predicament. How can one be reconciled to God then? Well, God must do it and thus enter grace 
and mercy. But I went through all that because I think we need to understand man's predicament of sin to fully understand the loveliness of grace and mercy. Now, we need to think through these two amazing attributes today, but um, I just wanted to say quickly that there is much in the Bible regarding grace and mercy. So it was difficult for me to determine this morning what I was going to try to put into this next hour um, for you. And what I decided to do was to uh, divide our lesson into three parts or three aspects of grace and mercy. Uh, we'll look at number one, um, grace and mercy and salvation. Um, that's dear to my heart and Grace and mercy is such a part of that. We'll spend probably most of our time talking about grace and mercy and salvation. Number two, we'll see God's grace and mercy in our daily lives. And then thirdly, if we have time, and I, I'm hoping that we do, um, we'll talk just a little bit about grace and mercy to unbelievers or what's called um, common grace. And you'll find out why that's important uh, when we get there. But before I look at those... Um, I think it's important that we define the terms from a human perspective. If you just look in the dictionary, what you'll find out is that it says that grace is favor or honor with courteous goodwill. That's pretty simple. And it says mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone of whom it is within one's power to punish. That's a little better, but again, that's uh, on a, purely on a human perspective. Interestingly, the dictionary lists grace as a synonym of, synonym of mercy and therefore mercy as a synonym of grace. But from a spiritual or theological perspective, there's far more to these terms that we certainly need to understand. You've probably all heard in um, Christian circles the comparison of grace and mercy in this way it's said that grace is God giving us what we don't deserve and mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. It's almost a tongue twister. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve and mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. That's not too bad, but it doesn't give us the full picture either. Uh, my Bible dictionary defines grace as undeserved love of God in providing salvation for sinners. It's God's free and spontaneous action, it says, taken to meet human need, especially in providing salvation and in enabling the believer. Isn't that good? To be gracious and to bestow grace is God's nature. It's who he is. According to Psalms 112.4, he is gracious and compassionate and righteous. Joel 2.13 says the same, similar thing. It says he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and relenting of evil. And he is the God of all grace, according to 1 Peter 5.10. And we also know that God is um, a God of mercy. Mercy is defined as pity or compassion that results in forgiveness of a penitent sinner rather than eternal punishment. Ephesians 2.4 God is rich in mercy. Hebrews 4.16, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we might receive mercy. 2 Corinthians 1.3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. One author wrote that mercy is 
love that responds to human need in an unexpected or unmerited way. At its core, mercy is forgiveness. Love, mercy, and grace are always intertwined because, again, that's who God is. John 3.16, probably the most well-known verse in the entire world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It's all there, love and grace and mercy. Grace and mercy, they're just, they're intertwined. And yet, as we've seen by the definitions, they're not exactly the same either. Um, I have this, this is a MacArthur quote. You, you have to listen close to this. Um, I think it's very good. It, it shows some of the differences. Um, it says this, it says, whereas grace relates to guilt, Mercy relates to affliction. Whereas grace relates to the state of the sinner before God the judge, mercy relates to the condition of the sinner in his sin. Whereas grace judicially forgives the offender for his wrongdoing, mercy compassionately helps him to recover. And as we continue our definition of, of terms, um, I thought I would just give you some, um, just show you how some well-known theologians describe grace. A.W. Tozer wrote that grace is the good pleasure of God that inclines him to bestow benefits on the undeserving. Louis Burkhoff said grace is the unmerited operation of God in the heart of man affected through the agency of the Holy Spirit. And Pink, in our book that we've been studying, um, he says this. I think it's very good. He says, divine grace is the sovereign and saving favor of God exercised in the bestowment of blessing upon those who have no merit in them and for which no compensation is demanded of them. Grace and mercy are freely bestowed by God. There's nothing you can do to get them or keep them or pay for them. They are free gifts entirely from God. We know that God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy and he will have grace on whom he will have grace. Exodus 33, 19. If we had any part in it, you and I, if we could do anything, grace would not be grace. Pink goes on to say that it is pure sovereign grace which alone determines the exercise of divine mercy. It is the merits of Christ, he says, that makes it possible for God, the righteously, uh, <clears throat> for God to righteously bestow spiritual mercies on the elect, justing, justice having been fully satisfied by the surety. Now, we all know that God's perfect justice involves certain and complete and deserved punishment for sin. And mercy is all about pardon and compassion. God cannot simply set aside justice to make room for mercy. It's only because the penalty for sin was satisfied through Christ's sacrificial death on the cross that God extends his mercy to undeserving sinners. And with that, let's look directly into our first point of the day, and that is grace and mercy in salvation. Now, we've already established that man has a problem a sin problem, right? We all sin, we all deserve eternal punishment in hell, and we can't save ourselves. That is a problem. 
We're born with a sin nature and we do sin. The Bible tells us that we must therefore be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven, John 3, 3. But because of human depravity, there is nothing in us that desires God or is even capable of responding to God. In Romans 3, it tells us that there is none righteous There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good, not even one. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And beyond our lack of desiring God, Ephesians 2.1 tells us that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And that renders us unable to respond to God. We're spiritually dead. And this is important. There is no escape from such a desperate predicament as this apart from the sovereign intervention of God's saving grace and mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's the only way out. God's grace and mercy. Every aspect of salvation is God's grace. Did you know that? Everything about it, every aspect of it. I'm going to give you a list of things. These are the ones I could find. There's probably more. You don't have to look these up. I'm just going to read through them quickly. But this is, this is God's grace in salvation. God ordains our salvation. Romans 8, 29. He calls us to himself. Romans 8, 30. He draws us to himself. John 6, 44. He grants repentance. Acts 11.18. He accomplishes the new birth. John 1.13. Even our faith is from God. Romans 12.3 and Acts 18.27. He justifies the believer. Romans 3.24 and 8.30. And he glorifies the believer. Romans 8.30. All of these and more are bestowed on us through God's grace and through his mercy. God's grace is not merely present in salvation. It is salvation. There's no salvation without it. And you know, the Bible is full of verses. We could stand here this morning and just read verses in Scripture. Um, in In the Greek text, it's said that there are 150 mentions of the word grace alone. Paul used um, the word grace something like a hundred times, mercy like 70 times. Well, we aren't going to look up 170 verses um, this morning, but we could. We could do that. But I want to give you just some examples. Uh, These aren't long. uh, Again, you don't have to look these up, but there are are a couple that I would like to look up. But just just hear what the Bible says. Romans 5.21, so that as sin raised in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 2 Timothy 1.9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Titus 3, 7, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Titus 2, 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. And then mercy, I'll just give you several here. 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy 
has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Romans 9, 16. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or on the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Titus 3, 5. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And there's many more, but I, I want you to look at a couple of sections of scripture. Turn, turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I, I want to, let's see, I'll start reading uh, in verse 3. Ephesians 1, 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he favored us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our wrongdoings, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. If something was going to bring tears to your eyes, I think that should do it. That is an amazing section of scripture. God has given us every spiritual blessing in Christ. So that we could be holy and blameless before him. And it says to the praise and glory of his grace which he has lavished upon us. Well if you don't have the picture yet turn just the chapter over to Ephesians chapter 2. This is so good. Ephesians chapter 2 let's start in verse 1 says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince and the power of the air and the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But here it is. But... God, being rich in mercy because of his great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. Paul's focus in these verses is on God's work of salvation through grace because there is no human work that can do anything to save us. We're saved by grace through faith, it says. And that not of ourselves. Your best works, your very best works can do nothing. So as we've been talking about man's predicament in sin, we see in these verses man's way out of eternal punishment and that is by grace through faith. Because of God's great love and by his grace and his mercy, 
God sent his son into the world as a man born of a virgin, perfect in every respect. He lived a righteous life and he died on the cross to pay the penalty for sin in our place as our perfect substitute. Back in the 80s, when I was um, once again searching for the meaning of salvation, and I began to understand more about this concept that I just gave you on substitution. It was kind of beginning to make more sense to me. I thought, you know, now I see, I see why he died. But as I said, it was in the MacArthur study of the book of Romans that put the icing on the cake for me. It was specifically Romans 3.24 and his reference to 2 Corinthians 5.21 that hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, it made so much sense and it was a thing called imputation. I'd never heard that word. I didn't know what it meant. But I want, to look at these, I want to look at these two verses because I think it's so important in our understanding of salvation by grace through faith. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians uh, five, and let's uh, let's start in verse seventeen. It says therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away; behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Stop there. Paul is begging, it says, be reconciled to God. I wanted that. That's why I ask all those questions. But we're lost, we're sinners. How can we specifically be reconciled to God? Verse 21, listen to what it says. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We see here not only God's forgiveness of sin by the substitutionary death of Jesus, but we also see a new relationship with God, a reconciliation. But without an ounce of righteousness in me, how can that be? Well, verse 21 tells us. It says he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that what? We might become the righteousness of God in him. I had to say, what is this, Paul? <laughs> what are you talking about? It's the doctrine of justification flowing to us out of God's grace and mercy. Whereby God declares righteous the repentant sinner because he covers him with the righteousness of Christ at the moment he believes in the person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross. This is substitution and it's imputation declared at their finest Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, became sin, that's imputation, on our behalf, that's substitution, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That's imputation, once again. 
Imputation means to put into one's account or to credit to someone. God is amazing. Somehow, God the Father, by imputation, treated holy Christ as if he had committed all our sins, though he had not. He died in our place as our perfect substitute to pay the penalty for sin for you and for me. So that the wrath of Almighty God over sin might be exhausted on him instead of us and just requirement of the law met. That alone is amazing. But all of that so that it says the righteousness of Christ might be imputed or credited to us. When we believe. That's the part I missed. I never heard that. I knew nothing of it. But doesn't it make so much sense? It's... it's it's the loveliness of grace and mercy. And, by the way, no man could do this. No man has the righteousness to cover my sins, not even Moses or King David, right? All the things I thought were so wrong, <laughs> I'd say I had bad theology. I, I don't think I had any theology. Um, we are reconciled and justified all by God's grace and mercy. It's an amazing thing. But the second verse, Romans 3.24, you can turn there if you'd like. I'm just going to read the one verse. There's much to be read there, but just, I think for the sake of time, um, I'm just going to read you one verse. Romans 3.24, it says, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. I went to some of the notes that I made way back when regarding this. I looked up a bunch of uh, quotes that... Uh, from, from his sermons and some of the things I had. So I'm going to read some of these to you of what he said about it that really struck my heart. He's speaking here, John is speaking here uh, in, uh, directly uh, of Romans uh, 3.24. He says, the verb justified in Romans 3.24 is a legal term that comes from the Greek word for righteous and means to declare righteous. This verdict includes pardon from the, <clears throat> from the guilt penalty of sin and the imputation of Christ's righteousness to the believer's account, which provides the positive righteousness men need to be accepted by God. God declares the sinner righteous solely on the basis of the merits of Christ's righteousness, and God imputes a believer's sin to Christ's account in his sacrificial death, and he imputes Christ's perfect obedience of God's law to the Christian's account. The sinner receives this gift, all of these gifts, as God's grace by faith alone. And there's more to this quote regarding grace. I'll give you, I'll give you more of that here in just a moment. But all of this, all of this is to the praise and the glory of God in salvation. Well, that's a lot to think about. But it's so amazing and it's so wonderful. I, to this day, when I think about salvation, I'm blown away. It brings tears to my eyes. It, it, it's, it's unbelievable. It's so exciting. And if you don't understand it, as I didn't, seek out someone who can help you, someone in this church. 
You can get the answers. They are here. But we need to move on. Um, Number two in our outline is God's grace and mercy in our daily lives. Uh, There's one verse in particular we kind of want to look at, but um, what what I have in mind here is that we all we all love the idea of grace and mercy, right? We all love that. As much as we love the idea of a free gift that costs us nothing, um, forgiveness of sins in heaven, and being ru- removed from such a um, hopeless predicament as sin's punishment, we all, we all like that. We trust Christ. Is that the end? Do we just carry on? No, you know that's not the case, right? But I want to show you a couple of verses of Scripture that I just think are important as we think about we think about God's grace and mercy and salvation. Now let's think about God's grace and mercy and just how you live every day, right? And again, there's much to be said on that. Um, I won't say too much, but I do want you to see a couple of verses here. You know, we read Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, right? For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, gift of God. Um, verse 10, however, says, we didn't go to verse 10. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Good works don't save us, but God prepared us to walk in them, to live righteously in our daily lives. Uh, 2 Peter, you can turn over there. To, uh, 1 Peter, no, I'm sorry. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. I'm just going to read this quickly. It says, uh, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellences of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the things in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. And then Titus 3, um, Titus 3, 3, if you want to look it up, I'm just going to read it quickly. Titus 3, beginning in verse 3, says, For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceiving, enslaved in various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hatefully hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not on the basis of the deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Well, this, all of this, all of this, well, let's, I'm going to read a couple more. Let's go down to verse 7. It says, so that just uh, being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy same statement. And concerning these things, we want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. Once we were a children of wrath, but now we are the people of God and we need to live like we are. The good news is that God, that we don't have to do it on our own. God calls us to live for him and he gives us the power of his grace to do it. You can turn over to 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 8. This is a great verse. If, you, if you're struggling with something, this is a great... There's a lot of verses that are 
that are great, but this is a good, this is a good verse to go to. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance of every good deed. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that we have all sufficiency in everything. That's our daily walk. We have everything we need to live for God in all abundance, in all liberality. Um, continuing from the earlier quotes that I gave you um, regarding uh, Romans, uh, this is another, this is what MacArthur continued to say regarding grace. It says, grace upholds our salvation. And again, he, he's, he's talking now about what happens to us daily. Grace upholds our salvation, gives us victory in temptation, and helps us to endure suffering and pain. Grace helps us to understand the word and wisely apply it to our lives. It draws us into communion and prayer and enables us to serve the Lord effectively. In short, we exist and are firmly fixed in an, in an environment of all sufficient grace. That's great. And notably, God's grace is sufficient in our lives and gives us strength even in our trials. Hebrews 4.16, Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of trouble. 1 Corinthians 12, which um, deals with Paul's thorn in the flesh, is, is a great example as well of God's grace in our trials and describes its, its power. pastor just taught on this a few weeks ago, so... I suspect we're all pretty well up to speed on that. But my point for today is just that um, to keep Paul from becoming um, proud, God gave him a messenger of Satan for which he asked the Lord three times that he take it away, right? You remember that? But what was God's answer? He said, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. So Paul determined quickly then that he was content with weakness, insults, distress, persecution, difficulty, so that the power of Christ would dwell in him. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And in it all, God's grace is sufficient. Paul's ability in ministry and in strife was due only to one thing, and that is God's grace. And so it is for us. 1 Peter 5.10, After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. We can boast in God's strength knowing that even when we are weak, God is strong. He always provides the grace we need no matter what the challenge. And dependence on him is actually the opposite of pride. Paul got his thorn in the flesh to keep him from being prideful, right? But to depend on God is the opposite of pride. James 4, 6. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. God's grace is sufficient, giving strength in all abundance in every aspect of our daily lives. And that's good to know. But we are running quickly out of time. So we are going to go to point number three. I just, I want to mention this um, in regard to grace to unbelievers. Does that exist? What is that? We're talking about grace in salvation, grace in our daily lives. Um, how does it affect, un how does grace affect unbelievers? Well, 
I think we'd have to say there's a sense in which even unbelievers benefit from God's grace. It's called common grace because it's obviously common to all mankind, not to sp specifically to unbelievers. I express, expect that most of you have heard the term common grace um, in connection with Matthew 5, 45. That's the one that's always given. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. We see God's loving kindness and grace present here as who he is, even though he hates sin and must ultimately punish sinners. Luke 6.35, God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Psalms 145.9, the Lord is good to all. He has compassion or mercy on all he has made. All he, all he has made. Acts 14, um, Paul is speaking to an unbelieving crowd about their recognition of the unknown God. Remember that? And he said to them, um, part of what he said was, he says that this unknown God said he, he did, speaking of God, he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. But I wanted to, I mostly wanted to give you, uh, this is a quote by Paul Eanes, uh, his definition of common grace. I think this is really interesting and I think this is something to think about. When you think about society, the evilness of society, we think about that more today, right now probably then we think this is worse. This generation thinks it's worse than before. Every, everyone does, you know, but this is pretty bad, right? And we think about that, but we think about how bad it is, but does God restrain that in any way? Is it maybe not as bad as it could be? I suppose that's possible. But I, I think this is interesting what he wrote, and we, we can... Uh, I, I think I'll, it, it says, that, again, common grace, it says... It's those general operations of the Holy Spirit whereby he, without renewing the heart, exercises such a moral influence on man through his general or special revelation, probably thinking of Romans 1, that sin is restrained, order is maintained in social life, and civil righteousness is promoted. And I think that's saying it's just not as bad as it could be. Right? If, if sin goes unrestrained, where do you end up? You better have an ark. Right? He says then, it also is including those general blessings such as rain, sunshine, food, drink, clothing, and shelter, which he imparts <clears throat> to all men indiscriminately, where and in what measure it seems good to him. Common grace does all that through goodness, his kindness, his grace, and his mercy. And I guess really what I wanted you to see from that, just as a final thought, um, I just wanted you to see how great and how strong is the influence of God's grace and mercy and how it permeates all of society not just us as believers. God's grace and mercy is there, his kindness, his love. And I think what we need to do is tell others about that. We're not here just for good deeds and good things. But we are here to live righteously before God. And I think that's important. Well, my watch says we're about out of time, so I, I think that's probably enough for day, today. I know this has a, kind of been a whirlwind tour. Um, I think I'm out of breath anyway. Um, I hope it's been helpful. Uh, I, I really, what my desire is that you've heard something that, that you'll think about over the next weeks, or that something that you maybe think, oh, I wasn't sure about that. Let me study that some more. 
That's, that's what I hope all of these attributes um, produce. And, and I kind of think, I kind of think that I am not the only person in the world that went through their younger years and didn't understand scripture. Any of you? Maybe? No, I no, no, not me. Praise God that he brings us to a place where we can understand the truth of his word, understand the gospel, and understand about his grace and mercy. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Lord, we're just grateful this morning for your grace and mercy. When we think of these things, we're amazed and in awe of who you are. We know that your greatness is to be praised. Lord, help our hearts to understand more about you. We bless your holy name. May we be a thankful people. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.